so tonight we're going to be talking about transitioning from employee to entrepreneur. Um, the, 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 the transition is not only just in a business setting, but also in personal life. Um, uh, we currently live in a world of lots of uncertainty out there. Uh, we're just picking this this year alone in 2011. Yeah, you know, we had uh, tornadoes and floods and you know all sorts of uh, natural disasters that come upon us. And no one at the beginning of 2011 could have predicted what their life was like. But it spells that um, that change for whatever reason is coming very quickly through life. And, uh, and overnight, if we're in the wrong area, we can suddenly find that what we felt was important is no longer as important as we thought it was. Um, federal deficit. Boy, this is in the news. Look at the stock market. Look at what's happened in Europe, what's happened to currency markets. I thought this slide's interesting. What this shows is all these little squiggly lines are reflecting... Uh, starting back in 1910, our, our federal tax brackets for the system. It shows how the bottom line, we started at like a zero tax rate, and initially in 1910 we had a 7 8% tax rate. And then over the years, uh, especially 1940, we have the wartime, we need to fund the war. So they raised tax rates all the way up to 90%. Could you imagine going to work in the top bracket and paying 90 cents of every dollar you own to the government, boy, aren't we blessed today. But, um, but the red line represents keeping the federal uh, budget in line. It was, it was effectively a balanced budget. We had a, a gold standard, a gold reserve. We made sure that the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, had money uh, uh, to back what we had out there. Uh, but something interesting happened. And if you can see the correlation between the lowering of tax rates and in the increasing of the federal deficit, when we began to go up the gold standard in 1973, by 1980, you know, there, there seemed to be, as the Tax Reform Act of 1981 took effect, a, a, a lowering of the tax rates and a correlation of escalating of the federal deficit. Uh, there was about that time that I went to go work for the IRS. And the IRS was trying to understand where all the tax revenue, tax dollars were. In fact, in the Bay Area, they hired 300 of us at once. And uh, they told us, your mission is to go find what they called the tax gap. Those taxpayers are cheating. Go find out where the money is. And so I thought, I'm on a mission you know, to, to, to solve this uh, solve this problem. And two and a half years into this, I, had a, I was newly married. My wife comes to me one day. She says, Alan, you need to quit your job. I said, why? I like the people and work with good training. She says, no. She says, listen, when I married you, I wanted to have friends. And we have no friends. <laughs> you tell people where you work and we're all alone. <laughs> so... <laughs> So after going through uh, two and a half years, I jumped ship, became a CPA, uh, got my MBA, and then in 90, I joined this uh, CPA firm that I'm at today, uh, Groco. little history on Groco. Why are we different? There's a lot of CPAs out there, a lot of CPA firms, and I'm not pitching a commercial at all for what we do, but the history is interesting and it's unique. Back in World War II, at the end of it, there were two generals that came out, uh, General Draper and General uh, Gaithier, and they, um, they were appointed by President Eisenhower to rebuild the infrastructure of Europe and Japan. And the CFO Ford Motor Company quit the position and joined up with these two generals, and they started this company called Draper, Gaither, and Anderson. And they were all about venture capital, about assisting new businesses and giving them funding and finance. Well, that was our first clients. And uh, in uh, the early 60s, one of the sons of the general came to the Bay Area, name was Bill Draper, started a company called Sutter Hill. 
And out of Sutter Hill was born National Semiconductor. And so, and then this same group of individuals went to start Oracle, Genentech, uh, Lotus. Uh, the, later on, you had uh, uh, Google and uh, Baidu. The number one, number two venture deals in the world were done by individuals that we helped to prepare their income tax returns and, and give them assistance. So we have this unique perspective of seeing some of the things that they've done as entrepreneurs during their lifetime. And um, there's about 30 families that require us to be a little bit bigger, but we do about 2,000 individuals that, and those individuals are, are fairly common folk uh, starting their own companies. In fact, I got to have my, my, my cohort here, Chuck, stand up. Uh, Chuck was one of my first clients. He had his return prepared by H&R Block. He was paying $125. He says, I, I'd like to use you, but I can never afford you. And I said, well, come on over and, and, uh, and, and check a little while later. He can sit down now, Chuck, but he quit his job. And he, uh, he said he was making 40000 a year. Sorry, but the statute's gone for client disclosures, and I'm going to tell him what you made. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, uh, he says, I'm going to quit my job. He says, but I don't really know the steps I need to take to make a successful business. And first thing I said to Chuck is I said, he had concepts and ideas. I said, you need to go get some money. Come back and talk to me when you have money. So he went out and sold his idea for $50,000 for 25% interest. And he says, I got some money. And within a, a matter of uh, 20 months, he set up a multi-million dollar business, ended up retiring for several years and a couple years back I said Chuck why don't you come work for Groco very entrepreneurial but he's he's a living example of how with a determination and with a passion for what you do uh, the sky's the limit for you guys yeah, um, if you hit the right model and and focus in so let's go to the next so we have um, the stock market I think that the news this week, or the, the, there's been a constant theme about, is Europe going to be around? Or are they not going to be around? And this volatility just continues to swing in the market. Well, the reality is it's, it's never changed. Um, the stock market is never predictable. It's always a, a vast amount of uncertainty. In fact, no stock worker can ever tell you if the stock is going to go up or down. The answer is it will. Okay, and people will make money both ways. So what you want to do in, in today's world is look at with what's before you the things that you can predict and the things that you can't predict. Okay, so stocks are not one of them. Um, the, let's go to the next. The, the reality is that as, as we look at life, every one of us have one thing in common, and that is we're all mortal. Right? We're here from birth to death. So at the point of death, every concern, every relationship, every problem that you had in life, it doesn't matter anymore. Right? You're mortal. It's gone. So when you're looking at this question, where can I turn for peace? The question is, what do you want to do in life? Where's your passion? What are you trying to overcome with adversity what are you trying to find with greater degrees of certainty you may be going through a job loss you may be going back through a situation in your life where you're trying to find stability you got bills to pay you got family to feed you have the struggles that you're you're facing on a day-to-day -day basis and it's not necessarily always financial it can go well beyond that. My wife came to me recently, and she had a, a question that she posed about one of my children. And she said that uh, I have seven kids. So a little bit of history. You no, know, it was by design, not by accident. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my wife and I decided when we got married, we would have seven children. And I made 17000 a year, and she made 24000 a year. 
And when the first child came, she stepped in and says, I'm quitting my job. I said, honey, I'm an accountant. I'll assure you, if you do that, we are going to starve. And she says, that's not my problem anymore, is it? <laughs> so, so it was a... It was adversity in my life. I had no choice. I said, I've got to do this on my own. Nevertheless, where we looked at life, we went all the way to the end. And I said this very question. I was reading a, an article in the Reader's Digest, and the article said this. They were in the rest home, retirement homes, interviewing people that were bound to wheelchairs laying sick in beds, and they said, if you could do it again, what would you do? And they said, we would take more risks. We would experience life to the fullest, and we would do everything that we wanted to do because where we are now, we realize all that we have is our time, and our time passes by quickly. And there were things that mattered and things that didn't matter. Okay? So when you're Looking at goals and setting a foundation for life, I would encourage you start with the end of mine, as Stephen Covey says, and work it back. And, um, and then that way, the path that you choose, if you set your goals and your mind to that, you can get to where you need to be. Let's go. Okay. So where we are to now, now we've got lots and lots of uncertainty out there. We have things that we can't control, but then we have certainty as well as uncertainty. Okay? So let's look at, let's look at the law of business. Okay? People that have started big, successful businesses have had certain things in common. Okay? Number one, they were able to use other people's time you can, in leveraging and other people's money. Okay. Okay, time and money. How did they do that? They went to financial institutions and says, we're going IPO. Can you give us a bunch of money so that we can make an international business? Okay. And with that money, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a series of processes. So Hewlett Packard says, we've just invented a laser jet printer. And we have a factory, we have people that we can put on the floor, and they'll continue to make these printers all day long, and we'll sell them because we have a market base in there. Okay? Well, the reality is, what pushed time and money was a demographic trend. Let's go back and see really what happened. Although we had growth in the economy, it really did not begin to scale as we looked at the federal tax system until the early 80s. And in the early 80s, you had a group of individuals that we refer to as the baby boomers. See, the baby boomers back in the 60s created an industry called the Schwinn Bicycle. Schwinn Bicycles were everywhere. And in the 70s, as these baby boomers began to grow, you needed the convenience of the fast foods and the convenience, so you had companies like Sara Lee start to come up. You had General Electric and Whirlpool appliances, and California real estate started to expand. In the early 80s, you had the consultants, the middle management, investment bankers come, and that continued on till the 90s and the 2000s. It began to kind of go up and down. Well, it started in about 2010, there's going to be a, a demographic change. And the last change here, you can next slide, is going to create a problem with trying to continue to scale businesses as they have in the past. Because in the past, where you use other people's time and other people's money, first of all, the banks do not have money. Has anyone heard that? <laughs> In fact, I was with someone yesterday, uh, and uh, this guy owns 70,000 acres of land in North Dakota, so I figure he, he knows this thing about no money around, right? He said that the, the, we're talking about this about, he says the Federal Reserve has been the primary purchaser of their own treasury securities. 
So you have a Federal Reserve Bank that's guaranteeing the stability of a dollar, just buying dollars because no one else is there. And what's the net effect of that? It keeps it down to low interest rates. About a month ago, I was out fishing in Wyoming, Wyoming, and I had two of the Federal Reserve presidents with me together with uh, individuals named Paul McCauley. He used to run a $26 trillion bond fund called PIMCO Investments. And there was just a small group of us, and we're sitting around one evening, and Paul pulls out a dollar bill, and he says, look what I have. It says Federal Reserve Note. It does not state any rate of interest. It does not state any due date for me to redeem this to the Federal Reserve. And he says, and you guys have no money. So what exactly is this thing that I have in my hand? And he went on to explain that the only reason that a dollar continues to trade is because people believe it has value. Well, with the collapse of Lehman Brothers back in 2008, we went through a paradigm shift in this country. And the reality is we don't know what that shift means to our monetary supply, but we will continue to find out what it means as we go through uncertainty. But one thing is certain, that going forward, we will have less money and we will have less time to put companies together So the new scale, if you're going to start a business, will have to involve technology. Okay? Next slide. The more you leverage, the quicker you will build or lose wealth. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's look at the recent trends in the economy. Okay? Deleveraging of financial markets. Yeah, so which effectively, as they continue to deleverage, it's putting less of your money into work. Okay? The baby boomers and the declining population. An interesting statistic, this is certain. This is the, the Deloitte did a study and said that beginning in 2010, and over the next 15 years, 80% of our workforce will be retired. Think of Hewlett Packard with 22,000 employees going to 4,000 employees. A lot of empty buildings. You know, people say, well, that can't be. I'll say, wait a minute. So, how many people in their 80s are going to be around Costco pushing carts of stuff to their car or buying more computers for the office? So as you begin to look at this, you say, okay, yeah, I think there's going to be a change. And the way that we used to see things are not going to be what we see into the future. There will be less people to fill vital positions. Even the game Jeopardy has put the humans in, in, uh, in Jeopardy, right? The Jeopardy can now play, a compu- yeah, can play the game against a human and do quite well. So we're seeing technology advances the new leverage. Artificial intelligence is starting to get better. These computers are self-perpetuating. We're beginning to do a lot more with a lot less because of technology. And I think we're all feeling it in our lives. We're like, what the heck is happening to me and where's my time? Someone sends you 450 emails a day and you're feeling I need to respond to all these and you leave the office and you got iPads and iPods on you that you keep on clicking on these. You're texting. You don't answer phone calls because it takes too much time anymore. Technology is just making us nuts, right? So as you begin to look at this, it's continuing to scale growth. More efficient, moving much quicker. In fact, here's a statistic given to me by one of the leading venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. He's one of our clients. He said 60% of the jobs five years from now will be in technologies not even invented today. And in that same five-year period, we will make the same technological advancements that we made over the past 100 years when we went from the horse and buggy to the transportation systems today. 
unfathomable. People cannot even begin to predict what we're going to be experiencing into the future, but we will experience it and it will move quickly. So let's look at deleveraging the economy. As baby boomers continue, just, just run through all these. This, okay. We all know about the crisis with the financial stuff. The, the reality is, with fifth, if, if you look at our gross uh, national product, our GNP, and the total federal debt out there, we have $56 trillion of debt and roughly about a $14 trillion GDP. So we're bankrupt. It doesn't matter what people say. We're bankrupt. It's not a question of what does that mean. It's just, you know, it's, it's the way our life is going to be. And, and something is going to happen to even this, this out. But the reality is this, and the certainty is this. We're all in this game together. So in spite of an economy collapsing, and Europe or Japan, or, you know, when, these, when everyone is getting afraid, who are they putting their money with? They're all running back to the U.S. and buying U.S. Treasury securities. Even the Federal Reserve buys U.S. Treasury securities. By the, that's not a good thing for them to be buying the T-bills. They own currently $1.8 trillion. But the reality is we're all continuing to get old together. And we'll figure this out. Let's go to the next slide. These are the statistics I would pay attention to. The demographics. By 2050, 60% of Europe's workforce will be over 60. In fact, you won't even see the traditional European. They will be gone. Their, their population has continued to decline. Most of Europeans now, most of Europeans now in defining traditional, you know, that came over and immigrated to this country, they won't look like us. They will look like people immigrating into Europe from Africa, the Middle East. Uh, their demographics have shifted. Okay? Industries uh, will continue to suffer. You'll have healthcare, manufacturing, energy, the public sector. The reality is they have cures for cancer, breast cancer. They can detect 10 years before it actually appears. They have the technology to understand the genetics of the DNA. Well, why don't they fix that right now? Well, they don't fix it because there's a big industry that's dependent upon drugs and MRI exams and the, the whole processes. Well, what happens is people disappear. They have to let it come. So these are some of the changes that we'll see. Um, interesting statistic, as 2 million baby boomer engineers retire, they're only going to have 198,000 engineers to fill the space. IT jobs, 300,000. Out of 1.3 million new IT jobs will go unfilled. You know, they'll use technology to figure it out. Technology will become a bigger player. And so 60% of all the new jobs are required by skills only held by 20% of the current workforce. So what, what we're witnessing in here is that technology will become to dominate. It will begin to rule. Okay? This slide is interesting. What this represents is the countries of the world and the declining demographics. So, in the, the, just explaining this, in the orange line, this represents new jobs that were created between 1970 and 2010. The blue line represents new jobs that will be created between 2010 and 2050. They know this because the people are born today. So what happens, if you want to see what's going to happen, since we're at 2011 right now, in the next, uh, in the next uh, 40 years, flip the orange line upside down. And that will be showing people that will be retiring from the workforce versus the blue line people coming in. There are some countries, look at China. China, in 1975, they started on a path where they said, we'll have one child for every two people to control the population. So every generation, they're cutting the population in half. In China today, they will have 10 people retiring for every one person coming into the workforce in that time period. Okay, you can go to the next one. 
So decide now what you want in life. Remember, as we look at this, and we look, what I'm trying to outline here is I'm trying to outline certainty. Where do you want to end up? This is a, a, a five-generation pedigree chart. It's not filled in. Each of us have them, whether we fill them out or not. It's interesting, as you begin to go back, if you've ever done genealogy, which is like the number one hobby in the world, you'll notice every, every box, the, the dad, the mom, the grandfather, the great-grandmother, everyone had their chance at life. And they did something during their time frame. So as you're thinking through this, the reality is we are all on a timeline. And irrespective of what we currently face in life, you have the ability to make a change and make a difference not only in your life, but in the lives of those around you. You may be the next Bill Gates. You may be the next Mahatma Gandhi. You may do something that you, you just pursue a passion for and are able to impact the lives of many. So the question is, where will you be in the next five years? What would you like to do with your career, go back, your family, your location, be physically? My, uh, my wife, she just walked into the room. I just talked about you earlier, and so stand up and take a bow. <laughs> she, uh, a couple weeks ago, she came to me and, and she said, uh, Ellen, you need to talk to your son. And I said, what about? It's about a puppet. He wants to buy this. It was a mascot puppet that he's been online. I said, well, what's the problem? Well, he's asked me 15 times. I said, well, just tell him no. If you don't want him to buy it. She said, I don't want to buy it. But I get tired of answering him. And um, I asked her the question. I said, well, if he was to have the puppet, what would he do? And she says, I don't know. I just keep telling him no. And so I went back and I said, well, if, if we can first solve what it is that we want to accomplish by having it, then we can better understand how we make our decisions today. And so everything that you're looking at in life, relationships, careers, based on where you're at, start backwards. Where would you like to end up in five years, three to five years? Look at the timeline of you're looking in relatively small time compartments, because I can guarantee you in the next three to five years, there will be things that will happen in front of you in this earth that you can't even fathom today. You know, we see little local things like Joplin, Missouri, a tornado comes down, just wipes everything. Well, how do you plan for stuff like that, right? But we keep moving, right? We keep building. We keep moving through life. So the next one, okay? The thing that if you look at what you like to do, your, your life becomes a lot more fulfilling as you move through life with your passion. The most successful entrepreneurs are ones that they were entrepreneurs not because it was about the money. It was about the passion, the passion to create. Steve Jobs at Apple Computer, it was about creating and inventing new things. He had enough money to retire years ago. What kept him going? It was his passion. So for you, when you're looking at driving through life, if you're feeling anxiety, debt, job loss, your hopes, your dreams, you've got all this stuff in front of you, stop and take a moment to think about where my passion really rests. It may be, you know, I like to go out and I like to hike in Yosemite and just enjoy nature. Let's do it. There's nothing on this earth that says you can't do that. It may be that you want to go out and you want to create and you want to build something. You want to become a multi-gazillionaire. If that's what your passion is, take the risk and pursue it. As I stated earlier, 60% of the jobs five years from now will be in technologies not even invented today. Somebody's going to have to invent them. Somebody's going to have to drive this. And that person could be you.
What makes you happy? Is it your money, your career, your stability, your family, your health? I had a uh, client. He was a self-made uh, billionaire. Walked into his office one day. I took a sheet of paper, put it on his desk, and I said, look at that. You are a billionaire. He says, get out of here. And I said, what's the problem? He goes, that, that, that means nothing to me. I say, but everybody wants what you have. Everybody wants this. He says, no, they don't understand. Now that I have it, I don't need it. He says, what I really need is I need to be on the golf course hitting a golf ball and betting $5 to win the hole. He goes, that's real money. And, and so what he was saying in short is he was pursuing a passion, something that he loved to do, to hit a golf ball and beat the guy next to him in the fewest strokes. So as you look at what your passion is, remember the, the saying, you, you need money to go through life and to provide for the bills and to pay all that, but you don't need everything. You, know, you need enough for your needs. Enough for your needs, because what you want to do as you go through life, anybody that skews it too far to one direction, if it's all on the money, you're not taking it with you when you die. So what do you got? You'll be six feet under. No one cares what kind of car you drove or where you lived or what you owned. You know What, what they will remember you for, though, is how you affected them in, in their life. You know What was your relationship with them? So entrepreneurs, as you continue to build and create, you will determine your own destiny. Okay? As I said earlier, if you have a passion, pursue your passion and take that risk. Step out. Be adventurous. You're never going to get your time back. And if you fail, you failed. Abraham Lincoln ran for public office six times. He kept failing but he became one of the greatest presidents in the United States. He was never a rich man. He never had a lot of wealth, yet volumes and volumes of books got written about him. Why? Well, he was passionate about what he was doing. He believed in his cause. Every one of us has something. We have certain gifts, certain talents that we can contribute to others. We have ways that we can impact the lives of others, be it through service, building new economies. There's something during your lifetime that you can do. Study it out. Look at where your passions rest and build it. Okay. So here's how the steps to changing life works. Okay, Number one, based on where you're at today, think differently. And we're going to go through this. Go to the next. Think differently. If you want what you have today, keep doing what you're doing. But if you have a goal to be a successful entrepreneur in a business, if you have a goal to you know, reach a certain level of service and helping humanitarian causes, if you have a goal to impact the lives of others in a certain way and you're not doing it today, then start thinking differently. How are you going to get to where you need to be? The more that you can pick that path of where you want to be in that three to five year window and work hard at it, the sooner you'll get there. Focus on relationships. Relationships are paramount to anybody becoming successful, whether it be through a career, a new business, at home. It's who surrounds you will enable you to get to where you want to be. We're going to have Al Holby in a little bit come talk about one of the things that he does on this, this area. But let's go back. Three things that I always look at in relationships. It says, who do you know, who do you like, and who do you trust? Okay. If, if you're missing any one of those things, I know people and I like people, but I don't trust them. I'll never do business with them. Okay. The more you can get to trust, You'll begin to change in your own life. You'll begin to surround yourself with people that you're more comfortable being open and honest. 
and with open, honest relationships, the synergy begins to happen. Nobody builds an empire being an island of one. They build it as they can collaborate and join with others in the same cause. Okay? Learn to work smarter instead of harder. When you focus, you can accomplish more. Look at what resources, what tools do I have around me? How can I take advantage of that? Look at what's happening out there with the technology. I had a client come to me, this a very bright individual. He went to the best university in India. It was, it was IIT, is that, am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So he had a, he was 180 Mensa IQ, real smart guy, he comes to me. And he had just invented a technology that connected the CD-ROM to the motherboard. And he made a lot of money off this. And he says, you accountants don't know anything. You see, I'm an engineer, and I'm going to show you how smart I am. I wrote my own accounting program. And I'm going to use my accounting program and give you all my information. So I said to him, okay, how long did that take you to write that program? Oh, I did it in six months. Really? I can buy the same program for $29. Aren't you smart? <laughs> We're good friends. Okay, so the point is, what can you go out and buy to help you get your tools working smarter rather than harder? Next one. Communicate, listen, and persist. Your communication skills will be a factor. That's what my wife keeps telling me. Sit down and listen to me, honey. <laughs> and uh, the more that you can look with good, open, honest communication, having a two-way street, the more you're trying to build trust within other people, other relationships. You know, I went, to, I went to lunch today. I had lunch with uh, Steve Forbes. And we're, it wasn't just me. There were a lot of people in the room. But the, there was a, a person that, um, a friend of mine that invited me up and said, here's an individual looking for a job. Will you sit next to her and see what you can do to help her find? Well, I sat down there. And for two hours, I could hardly sit in my seat. She knew everything that I didn't know. And then more. <laughs> and I wanted to say something, but I'm like, I can't compete with all her knowledge. And I say that in a, a sarcastic way. The communication is open, honest, and two-way street. And the more that you're able to engage and inspire others, you'll build a good trust in the relationship and then use that relationship to help each other. The step five is focusing on success. Dream it. You, you can't get to where you're going if you can't dream your success. And so you want to be the type of person that as you set this out there, you want your path for others to follow. Now the entrepreneur, there are certain individuals that will be able to inspire and build. If Steve Jobs came today and said, I'm going to build a company, how many of you would invest? Okay, You've seen a good track record coming through there. So you want to be able to focus back on the success and become the type of individuals that others will want to follow. Let's go through. Okay, Be prepared to fail, but as you fail, learn from the failures, learn from your mistakes. Remember, it's about taking your risks. You'll set out to do something. It's like I remember back in my dating years. I was just never successful at anything. You know, I always wanted to set out on a date and I would always do something wrong. Well, you know, as you go through, you learn about yourself, you learn about other people, and finally you find out this is where my passion is, this is what I really like. And then you'll find the magic one that's for you. And the magic one that they're looking for. It's a two way two way street. So be prepared to fail, but also continue to move towards where your passion is, what you want. Okay. I have a few. Did we bring some of those books? Oh, wait. 
I have a few books up here. These are um, called The Power Within You. And this is all about the five-step process to becoming an entrepreneur. And then the other book that I have here is a, a DVD on the leaders of tomorrow. And this is interviewing 10 individuals from the, the CEO or chairman of the board of AT&T who managed, I think he had 40,000 people in his company, to Wally Holly, who had uh, created one of the most successful uh, venture firms in the United States about if they had a message for the people of today, what would that be? Okay, learn, learn from others and their successes. Every one of you have something very unique to give. And um, as you follow through with the passion, you'll find what you're looking for. Okay? And let me take, uh, Al, why don't you stand up here and come on and join me. Al, um, I recently um, worked with Al on a radio show. And um, Al runs a, a program called the Career Action Network. And why don't you tell a little bit about what you do? Good. Thank you. So, Al, I, I had him here. He's a great enabler. Actually, this is a passion that he has. Uh, there's no really hidden cost behind a big monetary contribution. It's, 
it's more of a passion. I think you charge a welcome with three dollars to join. About three. Three. Ten dollars a quarter. So oh, ten dollars a quarter. Okay. Okay. So, you know, and and it's just basically to cover mailing costs and you know, and keep stuff going. Um, but the power of the network dealing with people who have been enablers. If you're looking at a business, you say, I need a CFO or I need an executive, a chief operating officer. Correction Network, you can go talk to people who have done it. Al's taken a couple of companies out public, started, he's experienced in the field. And he's there in a mentoring role. You want to talk to people who have been successful in the various fields. Okay, let's go to the next. Let me just let me kind of end on this note. I want to show you this is a this is a three year growth plan that that we do. I um, this actually happens to be my company, and um, it doesn't matter what the blue says. What matters is the process that's in place. So you have you have uh, three components that go with this. You have defining what your vision is. So if you're starting a company. What is your vision? What are you going to be providing for? My brother, who's a patent attorney, he, sim he, uh, he summarizes it quite simply. He says, making money is really easy. I said, how's that? He goes, you just need to find out where money changes hands and take a small transaction cost. And the bigger the transaction, the richer you get. So I thought, oh, you're too simple with that. But... Needless to say, if you can find where a need currently needs to be filled, then you got a business model going there. A few years back, I, uh, I came to Fremont. I said, I want to build a business. I was just hired at my new employ employer at Groco. They gave me a desk. They gave me a telephone. But they didn't give me any clients and any work. They said, well, you didn't ask for that. We're just going to hire you. And I could see the writing on the wall that my job would not last very long if I wasn't able to change something. And so I said, well, what I want to do in the next three to five years is build a successful network. And I did. And I did it one client at a time by building one relationship at a time. But I knew what I wanted within five years. I was in the partnership. Within 12 years, I was the managing partner and we had been awarded one of the most successful, best managed CPA firms in the entire United States. So thank you. It was, uh, it, it was an honor, but it wasn't what I was looking for. And as we went through the process, we grew, when I took the helm, 65% in two years. My partner was 78 years old. He says... I'll help you. He goes, but I'm, I'm not as young as you are. And I said, but we're having fun, aren't we? He goes, oh, yeah, we're having fun. So, uh, so when you define your vision, be able to communicate that to other people. And the more that you're able to get them engaged with you, the better. So I have in my, my quadrants up there, I have something called personal professional development, culture, workflow, brand development, technology, and development. And then the last one we use is the deliverable. Once you set the goals out there, you ask returning and reporting what it is that they're, they're coming back with. So if you um, drop your card off with Chuck, I'm willing to share this type of stuff to you to give you some ideas to help you out. Let's go to the next slide. I just showed you a business slide, but when I started the presentation, you don't end up with money. You end up with relationships and when you're six feet under it doesn't matter how much money you had right but what matters is what you did in the lives of other people so we have something called a family plan family business plan and this deals with the aspects of where's my vision for my life where do I want to end up um, and so I have it broken into the quadrants of family spiritual, health, and work. So today, you know, in addition to running Groco, I have the seven kids, my wife and I manage the, the family there, the radio show, uh, starting at six in the morning, I teach uh, religion class to students, 
and in the middle of the afternoon, two days a week, I teach college. And there's not a lot of extra time there. But what, you know, what's happened with this experience as I've gone through it, I don't say this in a boastful way, but I say it in a way what happens was, is when people get around me, I have to lift them up and, and inspire and motivate them. I have to let them know that the closer they are to me, the more I can help them, whether it be from jobs or careers, because I just, you know, it, to me, as I go through the journey, it's about, not about me, but about the relationships and trying to help those around. So what we do here is, um, in our third thing in our deliverable, we have uh, a 90-day work plan. What are, what are we going to do between work, health, spiritual, family, schools, relationships, and then the last quadrant that we use is, this is on a weekly basis, which one of these goals have we checked off and accomplished? And so we never get to everything, but our process is we try to do as much as we can. We try to live as full of a life as we are. Because at the end of the day, you know, every one of us want to end life in our ideal situation. If you start to think about it, what would you like read on your eulogy? You know, how do you want people to react to you? As you begin to think about working life backwards, you can then set your mark and your path for where you want to end with that. And um, we're here to learn. We're here to gain experience. But one of the most important things is the relationship of those individuals that we encounter or come across in our life, helping them out. So, okay. And that's it. Questions? Yes. Sir, I'm not, not from India. I, it's hard to contemplate, contemplate you. You call yourself public accountant. Yes. Yeah, I would not have come to this lecture, let me be replied, if it had been delivered by any of the big four firms. I have seen your name in the papers, local papers, Tri City Voice, and all that, and you communicate to people, not also with people. And today you have inspired. I find a lot of youngsters for the first time they'll ever meet. So I inspired them for a living. I think you should keep up this good task and we wish you success. But at the same time, sir, I feel that we accountants have a role to advise the government also more forcefully in which direction they go, to which direction they can't go. Because today, including the Federal Reserve and Wall Street and some of the economists, they are not doing the job. That's the job I feel. Well, the eminent accountants can fill it. I would like to have your comments. Thank you. That's a very good comment. About three years ago, I started, uh, let me go back a little bit further. And this is, yeah. Can you repeat your question? Okay. So the question, the question is this. With what's going on, uh, as a chartered accountant from India, he sees a lot of financial turmoil, a lot of uncertainty in the world, a lot of irresponsibility within government and the actions of individuals that is creating a tremendous hardship on the individual lives of many people. Am I saying that correctly? Okay, so giving insight with that. I'll go back three years ago when I put my second daughter in college. Not everything that we do as we begin to look at life, will necessarily be in a rational basis. And sometimes we find ourselves doing irrational things. And um, when my second daughter started college, I decided that what I would do is take the money that I had. It was not a lot, but I had saved for my children's college education. And I felt my kids were doing just fine. And I donated it to a charity, an endowment fund. Further to that, I said I got a little bit more home equity, and I wrote a home equity check out, and I added that to the pile of what I donated in there. Well, the school got this donation, and the president hopped on a plane and said, who are you? 
And I said, well, I said, what I was trying to do is, is live a passion of trying to help other people. So long story short, what happened? This is not about that event, but it's about what happened as a result of taking this chance and this risk. There was a guy who was in contact with the development office who had a lot of interest in selling real estate. And he was interested in the big donors because he says, big donors can buy my property. So he said to the university development office, send all you big donors up here. I'm going to take them snowmobiling. So the next thing I found myself on the snowmobiling trip and a guy trying to sell me property that I had no interest in purchasing. But I said, listen, what, what would you like to do? What's your goal here? He goes, well, I got all this property and I'm trying to make a lot of money on it and I'm looking for buyers. Because nobody knows about this, this area that I live in. I said, well, how do they find out about it? He goes, oh, well, you know, you build hotels and make economic summits and you bring people into the area and you become rich and famous because they all want your property. And I said, well, I said, I'm not interested in your property. I said, but let's go do an economic summit and make this up. He says, right. I said, no, no, I'm serious about this. Let's go do something. I said, I, I'm not going to buy your property, but I'll help you. So I said, you go get the local people in the valley and bring them out, and I'll bring three Silicon Valley executives to speak at the conference. And we're going to make an economic summit. And it was about the time that Bear Stearns was collapsing and people were starting to grow concerned about the economy. Well, this project ended up, in the first year, this guy comes down, he sees all these people show up in town, he goes, I have been trying to get people into this town for years. And I have this great big fishing ranch. He goes, I'd like to give you half of my 150-acre fishing farm. My friend comes to me and says, hey, he's going to give us half of his ranch. <laughs> and I said, I'm not interested. Well, I am. I'll take it. I said, well, go, go take his ranch then. I said, but that's not in my, my mission statement. So he took half the ranch and became partners with this guy. But the interesting thing is from this little idea in the third year of our economic summit, we have two of the Federal Reserve Board presidents speaking. We have uh, Paul McCauley, who ran the $26 trillion bond fund. I have two satellite trucks sitting out the hotel. And I have net jets paying $50,000 to throw a hangar party. I'm like, I'm not paying any money for this thing. This is amazing. So it, it, it speaks to the difference every individual can make. But there are things that you can control in life and things that you can't control. And I'll say this, about the government, about the systems, about things, don't bother with it. You can't control all of those people, but you can control what's in front of you. You can control pursuing your passion. My passion wasn't to own a fishing ranch. My passion was to continue doing the things that I was doing, getting my kids through college and and, and, and helping in that way. So define what it is that you would like to see within three to five years. Now, you may say, well, I want to run for pr public office. Or, you may say, but, or it may be that I want to make a difference in the lives of the children today and give them a greater hope. Uh, I, I would say to answer the question, whatever you decide to pursue, if you have a passion, pursue it. Government's broke. <laughs> doesn't work so all right thank you all right all right so i think we're we're about there with time any other questions or yeah just one thing you might want to address how can someone tell if you have like an idea a business idea is a good one or a bad one that's an excellent question anyone have any uh, thoughts on that before i i say something how can somebody tell if a business idea is good or bad okay go ahead Who's going to give you money? That's a great way to tell. See, this is the guy that had an idea that someone gave him 50 grand for his... He didn't even have a product out there, right? But when you begin to go around... When I, when I came into Fremont and I needed to build my career, I didn't know where to start. So I said, where do you go if you have nothing in front of you? I said, ah, it's the Chamber of Commerce. So I walked down to the Chamber of Commerce, 
And I knocked on the door. I said, hello, I'm new to town and I need more clients. Any businesses can, that I can get can come to me and I'll send them a bill and they'll give me a lot of money and then I'll, you know, I'll get them. And they said, sorry, do you want to join a committee? I said, okay, I'll join a committee. So I, I joined something called uh, economic development. I said, oh, that must be business development. And I got into this, this, this committee I had two cell phone salespeople. No, they were AT&T telephone people. And um, I had a reporter from the San Jose Mercury News selling uh, newspaper subscriptions. And I had a financial planner. And every week we would come to this meeting and we would sit around, who has business for me? And I, I don't have any business. You give me business before I give you business. And I finally said, you know, this doesn't work, guys. We're going to start this all over. They said, what are you going to do, Alan? I said, we're going to make something here. What do you want to do, Alan? We're going to do breakfast. Great, Alan. Who's going to pay for it? Uh, the people that come to the breakfast will pay for it. And uh, I said, I'll go get the speakers, and, and you guys just come. So I went out to uh, Fremont Bank, Commercial Bank of Fremont, and there's another bank called Plaza Bank. I said, our breakfast is called uh, Breakfast with the Bankers. They have money. We all need money. So I went down to the chamber office and said, we're going to do breakfast, Breakfast with the Bankers. The bank said that they would give us the breakfast money. And uh, you just announced that we're going to have this. Well, overnight, we had 70 to 100 people trying to fit into a room designed for 20. And they said, what the heck did you do, Alan? I said, well, these guys have money, and we all want to know who has the money. And so this girl comes up to me, and she says, well, she says, I'm here to join your connection club. I said, what's that? Well, it's a club where you go, and you show up, and, and every week people will give you more business. I said, I want to join that club. Well, we don't have a club here, though. I said, let's go to breakfast and talk about it. So we went out to breakfast. And I took one of the other financial planners, and I said, we're going to start something called the Fremont Connection Clubs. And I said, when we do this, we're going to have it all organized and ready. So the first, the first week that we went in before the board, we had organized five connection clubs. And these are clubs that people come every week and give each other business. It's the power of networking. And there has been business after business after business become successful with that. They still run today after 21 years. They're still running. Why? Because it fills a need into the lives of others. Now, the ironic thing is, I never joined a connection club. I just started it. I got busy doing other stuff. But the idea is, with the question was, how can you tell if you have a good business idea? If people will latch on to your passion, when you communicate and they say, I like that idea. Let's go do something. Let's, now, but if you say something like, yeah, go ahead, and you're not capturing interest, then you've got to keep thinking it through. Where you feel a need and demand, people jump in. Yeah. You know, there's another way of asking that question. It's not how can you tell if you have a good business idea. I think the question is, are you in an area where there's a big problem that you're passionate about? Because, again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Very seldom, my experience in Silicon Valley, that anybody comes out of the chute with an idea that just works. They have to continuously, continuously iterate that idea, experiment, fail, 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 till they finally get it. Again, it took Google three years before they figured it out. And it took Steve Jobs, I don't know, a decade before he figured it out. So you've got to go into it, I think, with the idea of trying to match your passion to a real problem that's out in your world. When you put those two together, everything else will happen. Okay. The more that you can take uncertainty and make it certain, you have a business. You're solving issues, solving problems. Any other questions? Those are all good. Now, we have off on our... Uh, Website for those of you thinking about doing a business, we're in the top one percent of all CPA. I give stuff away for free, and I get about three thousand people a day in there. It has things from setting up a business plan to scaling businesses, 
lots of good information. But it's not the information that makes it happen. It's the, your ability to network in and the relationship. So if you get with people like Al or the Connection Clubs or something that, that helps to drive and connect people together, the more successful you're going to be in, um, in, in having a business that scales. I love telling Chuck's story. He's a guy that went from 40,000 to a multimillionaire in 20 months. You know, he, he found where there was a demand and a need, and he gave 58 people jobs as they scaled. Every one of you can do something of that if that's what your goals are. But your goals, you know, just it's what you have a passion for that, that builds it. So, okay.